in Mark right here where we're going to be studying Mark chapter 1 verses 9 through 13. We're seeing, we're going to see his inauguration in a way of his kingship right here with his baptism. And uh, it was the beginning, you know, of the, you know, his ministry, Jesus's ministry. You know, uh, we learn about his, what happened through his temptation and, and his baptism, but it's just, it's a, uh, something that I'm excited to bring y'all today because, you know, as I, as I said, I probably learn more than, than, than you guys do when I go through and I study this and, and I read and I'm like, it, it's, it's, I want to give you the fullness of what I've learned. And I, I feel like I can't never, you know, 100% be able to give it to you. But I'm going to try. You remember last week we learned, you know, going back on last week, reflecting on last week's sermon, we learned who Mark was. You know, uh, you know his, his mother's name was Mary, so it, he had in common with Jesus' mother, you know, being Mary. That, you remember we, I told you about there was, I believe, six Marys this total. You know, so don't get those confused. But, you know, she was from Jerusalem. So and she was a prominent woman. You know, we 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 learned that she actually the house that she had. Peter actually, when he got out of prison, he went over and uh, uh, that was the where he went and knocked on the door. And uh, he also we learned that Mark had a cousin named Barnabas, you know, and, and we we. Uh, discussed that part and how Barnabas along with Paul and Mark went on like one of the first missionary trips that they went on and yet Mark being a young man he uh uh left them part way through and it started causing some differences some contention between Barnabas and and Paul and uh, uh, also through Mark, right? And, and so it caused some stuff and so the, some disputes between them. And, you know, I, I mentioned how sometimes God, well, not sometimes, all the time God uses those things that may be bad for good to those who love him who are called in Christ, right? And so we know that. And that being said, we see that when Barnabas and Paul got into this this little argument about taking Mark along that that Barnabas wouldn't give up. And so they split their ways. And so Paul ended up adding Silas to the, the equation. And so where you would have had just the three of them going out to go see and going back on a missionary trip, now you've got double the missionary trip because then Barnabas and Mark went one way and Paul... And Silas went the other. So you got, you, he just, God just doubled it. And he used what may have thought was something to be bad as good. And then, you know, as time passed, we see that Mark and Paul reconciled their differences. And, and, and that, you know, we see that, we saw that in 2 Timothy and Philemon, right? And we also see with Mark, we remember we learned that he was closely associated with Peter. You know, and, and even possibly brought to faith by Peter to Jesus Christ because, you know, Peter calling him my son. And many people, you know, uh, looked that away as, uh, you know, that's like your son, you know, that you, you bring, you raise, you know, you bring somebody to the faith. You, you're going to always remember that. And so that person's going to be even dearer to you the more people that, you know, the, the people that you bring, that, that you have this relationship with and then they come and so you you keep them in their your heart you know and so then we learned that even the early church preachers you remember i i was reading about several of the early church preachers that mentioned and wrote about mark you know and how many of them you know they believed that mark was uh you know it was the first gospel you know even all the scholars that we say you know see today believe that and how they wrote down, and, and how that Mark would have wrote down Peter's recollections along with the Holy Spirit. This is what gave us 
this gospel that we have, this gospel of Mark. You know, and so uh, now we also learn that, uh, you know, the next eight chapters, you remember I told you about the divisions between them, and we, we learned that in the next eight chapters, Mark is really going to focus on revealing who Jesus is through his actions and teachings and miracles that's in there in Galilee. You know, he actually, at the beginning of that, he called the beginning, he called it, he actually titled it, this is the first few words that's there, he says he calls it the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You know, and, and Mark doesn't go through like Matthew and the rest of the gospels where it talks about all of his birth and, and different things. He sort of starts right from the beginning, right from the beginning of his ministry. You know, and the gospel, which is the good news, he starts immediately talking about this good news. You know, and he spoke about, the, you know, the first witnesses, you know, which was John the Baptist. He, he started bringing in, which John revealed, you know, the, the first two witnesses, the prophets, right? They revealed, you know, Malachi and Isaiah, the preparing of the way for Jesus, right? And then how John the Baptist prepared the people's hearts, you know, prepared them to receive by baptizing in water for the remissions of sins and how to receive Christ as their king. You know, John was set apart, we learned, that he was different from the others, you know, because of his clothes was made of camel's hair and, and uh, his, hair, you know, his uh, uh, leather belt, which he had, had echoes. You know, that picture of Elijah the prophet. You know, I, going off script here, what I, I have wrote, I was in my studies, I was thinking, and you could imagine the conversations between Mary and Elizabeth. And could you imagine being that we talked about John, John was a peculiar person. And so you remember when we first saw in the gospel, I think it's the Matthew, where where you know Mary and Elizabeth met and, and you know they were talking about they're both miraculously pregnant, you know, Elizabeth in her old age and, and Mary, you know, of uh, the virgin birth. You know, you can you can you imagine, you know, the 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 conversations that they would have had, just the the how how is your how is How's John? And that would Elizabeth would sit, well, different. Different. You know? And then uh strange, he goes out into the desert. You know, he's 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 different. And then you would have thought, well, how's how's Jesus? How's Jesus doing? It's perfect. Because Jesus was perfect. Could you imagine that conversation there? I mean, it's just something that, that, that I mean, it, that would have to be difficult. I mean, not difficult, but different. But could you imagine, Mary, the, the pride she would have had for having the perfect child? And then John, he, him being different, he would have been completely different. And the, the Bible talks about John was different. And there was a reason for that because he was Elijah. So, we see, you know, his baptism, John's baptism, though, was symbolic to being washed, you know, and putting away. You remember when we talked about Isaiah, where that being washed and put away your evil doings? You know, and that was his baptism. But then later we learned that there was coming one that would be baptized you with the Holy Spirit. And that would be Jesus. And that's what, Paul, that's what uh, uh, John preached. Repentance. He prepared the hearts for those that would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And how the Spirit, you know, outwardly, you can get baptized all you want. And that's not going to change you. It's a symbol. But when you're saved, 
and you're baptized by the Holy Spirit, your life changes. It's a drastic change. You know, we're going to learn a little bit, maybe a little bit more about that uh, today. One of the things that I didn't say and I wanted to say last week, well, I didn't say it because I, 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 didn't, I didn't catch it in my studies, but this week I caught it. And it just came to my mind was Jeremiah 13, 23. To give you the difference or what, it, what John's baptism, preparing the hearts, but not actually changing, not being a salvation, but preparing people. And you know, so many people, you know, the Holy Spirit changes us from within. And we have to depend on the Lord for that salvation. Nobody can change their self. It takes the Holy Spirit to change you inside to who you are. Jeremiah 13, 23 says, Can an Ethiopian change his skin or a leopard his spots? Then may you also do good who are accustomed to doing evil. What Jeremiah is saying here is that you can't. You can't go and do good when you're accustomed to doing evil. You can't change it. You can try to, but you, it won't work. It reminds me of the part where you remember Jesus talked about the person who swept his house and the demon was gone and he cleaned it up, but then later on the demon come back with seven more, realizing it was swept. See, you have to have Jesus. You have to be saved and let his spirit come in and change you. He's the one that changes your heart from a flesh of stone to flesh, from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh. So we learned about that a little bit last week. Now we're come to verses 9 through 11. You know, it says it came to pass, Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and, it, and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately... Coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. You know, let's, let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, dear Holy Spirit, give me your words. As I teach your word today, let your words come out of me and open and prepare the hearts for people to understand your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, as we first look at the start of Jesus' ministry, Mark mentions Jesus coming from Nazareth of Galilee. Although Jesus, we know, was born in Bethlehem, the city of David, you know, we saw that, you can look at that in Luke chapter 2. Mark focuses again on his ministry. You know, thinking about that, the first thing is I went and studied that and I got to thinking, what did those, you know, you remember, you remember in John chapter 7, verse 52, uh, where the authorities, the religious authorities, they were having a dispute on who Jesus was and where he came from. And they were talking, it was Nicodemus, and Nicodemus was actually saying, do we judge a person before, you know, we have any kind of trial and do all this stuff? And he was actually standing up for Jesus. And yet, one of the Pharisees come up and says, the very first thing he says to Nicodemus, are you from Galilee too? He said, search and look, for no prophet arises out of Galilee. So I decided. You know, 
I, I never really searched up anything that has to do with the very first part of Mark right here mentioning Jesus coming from, you know, Nazareth of Galilee. So I searched it up and let's see what it says. What, what, what does the Bible say about those? Well, there, there's an example you get from the John, prophet Jonah. Did you know the prophet Jonah came out of Galilee? He came from Gath Hefer in the region of Zebulun, which is part of Galilee. And that's in 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25, you can see. So obviously the, the Pharisees' assertion here from uh, that no prophet comes from Galilee is inaccurate. We saw Jonah. He came from Galilee. You know, another place I found was Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. And I was, as I was studying and as I was reading what, what people had wrote in commentaries, the Pharisees probably dismissed Galilee because they had bias about Galilee. A lot of people don't realize the Pharisees did, I mean, you know, the, the Jewish people didn't really like the Gentiles. And if you remember a lot of the, the, the things that were happening, like Samaria and all that, how they would, being, being that people were mixed, the, the Jews being mixed with the Gentiles, they would like, you remember the woman at the well and, 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 and just the different contention that was between them, the, the problems that arose. So maybe these Pharisees, and I actually believe these Pharisees, probably, you know, just had that, they were blinded by their bias towards Gentile people. Because when I read Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. And you all look at Isaiah. It goes more, it's clearly talking about Jesus. It's clearly talking about Him. But it says right there, Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is in distress. And when at first he, is, he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily, heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. So what do, you, that, what do you take of that? Right there we see that out of Galilee, that the people who walk, they've seen a great light. That this light, what did Jesus say? I, was the, I am the light of the world. And he tells us to go and be the light. You know, those who dwelt in the land, you see that there was this, oppression that was there there was something and when you look in history you'll come to find out that the the galilee that region that whole area a lot of gentiles immigrated to that area and so being that they immigrated there was several things that they had went through several times you know one one time i i read where where the jews tried to force everybody to be circumcised that lived in that area. Well, that didn't go over well because if you don't believe or, or whatever in the Jewish God, then you're not going to want to be circumcised like them. You're not going to want to have to force be forced to do the law. But we see that there was some st stuff there. So maybe, and I believe very likely that the Jewish people that chose to dismiss Jesus coming from Galilee, from that area, probably did that out of bias. And when we can't be biased towards other people either, and when I see a, a lesson in that, don't be biased towards anybody, wherever they're from. 
because you might be blinded and not see something that God is trying to show you. And especially like these people. So it was just something that, that, that I had looked at and I was like, wow, that, that Pharisee was completely wrong. We see Jesus arises out of Galilee. The great light. You know, the second part of this, this, this sentence right here, the very first one, it says, and he was baptized by John in the Jordan. You know, Matthew chapter 3, when we had read before, verses 1 and 2, it says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And in Mark, verse 4 says, John came baptizing in the wilderness, preaching baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So I, got, I had a question. When I, when I see these things, so why do you think Jesus would be baptized by John? If the baptism was a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, and we know Jesus didn't have any sins, what's the baptism there for? It's, it's a good question. It's a good thing to think about. You know, the Bible's really clear that Jesus is sinless. First, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, you know, y'all remember this verse. It says, For he made him who knew no sins to be sin for us. Right? That we might become the righteousness of God in him. He knew no sins. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who can, cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. See, he has no sin. So why do you think Jesus would be baptized by John for the remission or have those remissions? You know, when you go and you look a little further in verse 13 and 14 of Matthew, it says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him. See, John even had this same question. It says, John tried to prevent him saying, I need to be baptized by you and you're coming to me? See that same question. Why? Why, 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 I don't, you need to baptize me. I don't need to baptize you. So John was a little confused about that also. So let's see what, Aunt, what Jesus says. Jesus said right there in the next verse, he says, but Jesus answered him and said, permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. So what is this for thus fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness? What, is, what does that mean? And so that was the, the second question. After I looked at the first question, this is the second question. So searching a little bit more, you find in John, John chapter 1, verse 32 through 34, in the middle of verse 33, he says, he who sent me to baptize with water, John said. This is John's testimony. This is what John was saying. Well, who is the he who sent him to baptize with water? That would be God, right? God sent John to go baptize with water. Reading that whole verse, right, of the three verses right there it says uh and john bore witness saying i saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and he remained upon him i did not know him 
that's that's another question in itself, and I didn't want to get there because they were cousins. And how did that go about? But it says, But he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. So John would have beforehand, being a prophet, been told by God, however that happened, that, hey, you're going to see somebody being baptized and the Spirit will come down like a dove and remain on him. And this is he who is baptized. Now, that right there, when you go back to fulfilling for us to fulfill all righteousness, if the Father told John to baptize, right? And John even though confused about it, still baptized him. And Jesus going to John to be baptized, obviously Jesus being God, he would have known that he would have had to have that happen, that he would have had something said to him, that he would have been maybe known already about it. And that might be the reason why he said it was for us to fulfill all righteousness. See, Jesus, the baptism Jesus had from John was fulfilling God's righteous plan. It was an act of obedience that Jesus was doing to his Father. Right? He was submitting to God's will. And that sets an example for us. You know, I thought about that, that example. Have you been baptized after you believed? If you haven't, you should be. That right there is an act of obedience. You're supposed to be baptized. That would be you submitting to God's will for you to be baptized. What did, my, what did we just learn last couple weeks ago in Matthew 28, 19? It says, go therefore and make disciples. That's another thing that's submission. You, you know, that's God's will and an act of obedience to go and make disciples. So each and every one of us are to go out and witness to the world to make disciples. But it says to go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So each and every one of us is to go and be baptized once we believe. That's an act of obedience that Christ set before us. See, He baptized... There's more to it than just that. But that's one of the things that I see right there is that it's, it was a, he was being obedient to the Father's will. That's how he was sinless. So when we look at the rest of, you know, uh, 10 and 11, it says, And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Well, when we see John right there, what we just read, he said, But he who sent me to baptize, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified of this. It goes pretty much right there. Jesus' baptism, though, 
right here marks that beginning. That coordination, you know, a king gets coordinated. You know, when, when a king becomes a king, he goes through. It's just like when a president becomes a, a president, he goes through an inauguration. And that's where that, what you would call his uh, authority comes from. From the people that inaugurated him. Well, the Father and the Holy Spirit came down. And he said, this is who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is how you will be saved. And I have seen and testified. How did he know that he was the Son of God? Because he saw, you are my beloved Son, into whom I am well pleased. He was right there, saw firsthand, you know, firsthand on that. He saw the heavens parting. You know, picture that in your mind's eye. You know, we, we probably have more of a, if you watch movies or whatever, you probably have more of a, a visual image of maybe what that looks like than, than most people. I kind of think of a, when I think of this, I think of the what we're looking at right here just being ripped open. And that same word, when it talks about, you know, being ripped open, You know, sort of describes an opening, like a rift, like a, a, a different dimension. It opens up and you see the real thing. It's just like when the sky rolls the scrolls back and the sky's rolled back like a scroll. You just think of an unrolling of a scroll. It's just right there. This is what will happen with God will we'll come back. It's like the, the what we see is not as real as what the reality is behind what we see. I guess that's a way of thinking about that. But but that that word parting, the heavens parting, you know, I just see that and then the spirit coming down like a, a dove. And, and, and when I it, it doesn't mean that a dove floated down. It just means that the way that a dove lands is peaceful, graceful, not just slamming into something is just peaceful. That's kind of what that means. But this right here was marked the beginning of his ministry, the beginning of his reign, the beginning of the reign of the king. That's why I brought these, these songs this morning about he's like no other, no equal, right? Right? When we looked at those songs, there's nobody equal to him. And so that's the beginning of his public ministry. God the Father publicly affirmed Jesus' ministry and identity. And so you say, well, okay. I got to thinking, you know, where else can I? I want you to turn to Matthew. You, you, you guys, turn to Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 through 27. Because Jesus uses this same thought here too about His authority, right? And if you look at it and read between the lines, you'll see exactly. Because, you know, Jesus didn't give these Pharisees, this, you know, the chief priest and the elders, the, uh, the answer. Listen to right here what it says. It says, Now when he had came into the temple, the chief priest and the elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? But Jesus answered and said to them, I will also ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, where was it from? From heaven or from men? 
And just stopping right there and think about this. What does Jesus do when they start saying this authority? Where are you getting this authority from? What does Jesus do? He takes them right back to the baptism of John. Takes them right back. And these guys being cowards, trying to be deceitful, they sit there and they reasoned among themselves. It says, if we say from heaven, he'll say to us, why then didn't you believe? You know it's coming from God. You should believe it. Then it, but if we say from men, which is what they believed, obviously, like I said, they were cowards. Then they knew that they would probably be, they were feared because they would probably, because they knew that they saw John as a prophet. For the multitudes, all count John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus and said, we do not know. And he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. You see, the answer could have been right there. They could have been given right there. The Father, at the beginning, showed that baptism. When I was baptized by John, Just reading between the lines there, you can see. When Jesus mentions the baptism of John, he indirectly points to his own baptism by John, which was a significant event where he divided, his, his divine authority was affirmed by the Father God. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This divine endorsement clearly indicates Jesus' authority came from God. So, as we go on, we see Satan starts to tempt Jesus. And that's all Mark talks about that. I probably went more into it than they did bringing up Matthew and John and all those. But I just, I think the point is that that was, Jesus was coordination of the king. And we saw that right there. Just like you see the last king over in England that was coordinated, just like you see every four years or so a president being inaugurated, Jesus you see it in his baptism. That was his coordination. That was where his authority came from. The Father and the Holy Spirit. And that's what John said. He's testified to it. And that's also what Jesus brought back right there when they was asked, by what authority? Now as we go on to uh, verses 12 and 13, it says, immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beast and with the angels ministered to him. You know, when you think about that, and you think about Jesus, and the way Mark puts it, he says, immediately the Spirit drove him in the wilderness. There was an urgency to what, you know, Jesus. We, we get that in the other, you know, it, it, in Matthew 4, 1 through 11, we get a lot of details about what happened in the wilderness. In Luke, we get even more details that confirm it. Mark doesn't really say a whole lot. He just says, immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. And there he was tempted 40 days by Satan. The immediately, I think, emphasizes God's, Jesus' uh, 
action. It had to be something that was immediately. It suggests that there was no delay in Jesus' ministry beginning. You know, His mission after baptism was a divine affirmation and it just propelled Him straight into His ministry. Right? Right into the wilderness without hesitation. And there's a reason for that. And it drove him. You know, when you read that part, drove him. Take that term. It's a, it, it, in the Greek, it's called ekbeli, ekbeli. It's indicating a strong impulse by the Spirit. You know, it doesn't imply that Jesus was unwilling to go, being drove. But rather, it was an it, he, he was drove by his determination, drive, by his drive. You know, when somebody, you hear somebody, their drive, he was determined to go in and get this started right there. And that's something that Mark brings out differently than what the others do. It brings us new insight to what's going on. You know, Jesus, aware of his ultimate mission, which is go to the cross. Like I said, the only reason why he went to the cross, it wasn't the nails that held him up on that cross. It was his love for you and me that held him there. And so Jesus being aware, he knew he had a timeline. He had a timeline that led to his crucifixion and his resurrection. He immediately entered into that wilderness and committed to fulfilling God's will, His plan, without delay. He had a specific purpose and a set time to accomplish it in. So He immediately, and, and Mark loves that word, immediately, because everything about Him was determined. It was already set. He was ready to go. You know, that all accumulated it had to be on that specific Passover. I mean, it, it just, he had to have everything through his sacrifice, everything was determined straight to there. So while Matthew and Luke provides more details, you know, about, you know, specific temptations, Jesus faced Mark, you know, Jesus faced Mark's concise narrative focuses on the urgency and divine compulsion that behind Jesus' actions, moving towards that. You know, it complements the Gospels when we look at it, emphasizing that Jesus' ministry was driven in a sense of uh, timing and purpose. You know, he doesn't come up and he doesn't say many of the things that, that the others do. You know, we start to think about the rest of it and about the temptations. And you remember, uh, it just says that he was in there and, and you know, tempted by Satan. But then Matthew, you know, looking at some of them things, Matthew talks about you know, the, uh, and, and Luke, they talked about turning the stones to bread or jumping from the pinnacle of the temple or being offered all the kingdoms of the world. You know, when you think about that, we don't, I've never been tempted with those temptations that Jesus was tempted by. You know, but when you actually look at what that is, those specific temptations, you may not realize those specific temptations, what they actually relate to and relatable to. You know, when you think about uh, temptations, you know, the first one, turning the stone into bread. That's your physical needs. Jesus had physical needs and Satan tempted him with those physical needs. You got to eat. You know, what about jumping off the pinnacle, floating down 
You know, your feet ain't going to hurt you. You could just jump right off. Well, guess where that goes to? That's pride. Look at me. I'm up here. Voila, worship me. Or how about the one being offered the kingdoms of the world? The material desires. How many people not have material desires of this world? Boy, I sure would like to be in that guy's shoes. You see, Jesus could have had it all. So really it did relate to us when you look at it. You just might not think about it the same way because when you talk about turning. But let me assure you this. Jesus was tempted in every way that you were tempted. Hebrews chapter 4, 15. We read it a little bit earlier. It says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points, all points, tempted as yet we are, as we are yet without sin. That means everything. He was there for 40 days and 40 nights. The stones... The other stuff, that probably didn't take 30 minutes. He, being drove, went through that. He was determined to go through those temptations that you and me go through for us. You know, and so I sit there and I think about it. Of course, he can do that. He's God in the flesh, right? That's the first thing I come to. Because when you actually sit there and you think about this, this time that you're, you're focusing on this and you think, well, he's God. He can be tempted in all these things. Right? He can be tempted and he can overcome them. It's easy for him because he's God in the flesh. So I searched. And Hebrews 2.18 says, For in him, for in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to help aid those who are tempted. You see, he thought about that before I ever thought about that question. Yes, I am God. Yes, I can face those temptations and pass that test unlike Adam was. I can do that. But I'm here to aid you, to help you. When you have your, my Holy Spirit in you, when you trust in me and believe in me, I will help you through those if you won't grieve me, if you won't grieve my spirit. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overcome you except such as common to man. That means, guess what? Nothing's new under the sun. Every temptation you've ever felt, somebody else has gone through it. Your other people around you, you're not alone. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So Hebrews chapter 4, 16, we've been over on Hebrews a little bit. It says, let us therefore come boldly through the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. So yeah, he can do that. But he's right there with you the whole step of the way, if you have him. And he's even there when you don't have him, before you're saved, 
And you know it. Every person knows, every, each and every one of you that is saved knows firsthand that the Lord has helped you and helped you and said, come to me and helped you. Come to me, come to me, come to me. And many people out there, you may be facing that same, come to me, come to me, come to me. And he's there. He's helping you now because he loved you again. Them nails did not hold him on that cross. His love for you and me is what held him on that cross. You know, last night, after I was done, that was going to be the ending of my sermon. But last night I was sitting there thinking, because I was thinking about the Lord, and I was talking, I was like, I just don't have a fullness of the Holy Spirit in me a lot of times. I just feel like I still want more of the Holy Spirit. I've learned it. I'm learning it. He's washing me. And I was longing to be more like Him. You know, at one time in my life, in my walk, I wanted to be like King David as a man after God's own heart. Now I want to be more like Jesus. I'm past David. I love David. But I'm past David. I'm after Jesus. That's who I want to be like. I want to experience that fullness to Jesus, that fullness of the Spirit. And so I was talking, just, just long and just talking about it. And I said, will we ever have that much fullness? Will I ever get that much? And I looked up the Scriptures to see if I could, if they're what it said. It says Ephesians chapter 3, 16 through 19. It says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, and the height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. If you got questions, you search that Bible. He's got answers. <laughs> you know, I'm going to probably change my song that I had already planned. <laughs> I, I, I ran across a song the other day. Uh, it's just a country boy singing some music, and he said a song. And I, I, I'm going to have to look that up. My original song was going to be I Surrender All because I do surrender all. But I'm going to change it to another song. It's the, uh, uh, let me just look it up right here real quick. Because it, it's, I got a friend who can. Let's see if I can. find it I got all these different songs and I was thinking about bringing that to y'all today but I do got a friend who can and you have questions I can't bring you the stuff it says a friend who by a guy named Thomas Mack so anyways that's gonna be our ending song and uh 
It is what a beautiful name we had, you know, we, in the name of Jesus. So let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you today and I just praise you. Thank you for your word. If there's anybody that heard this, may you bring them to Christ. May you bring them. May you just bring them to you. Lord, we love you and we praise you and I thank you for your word. I thank you for the ability that you've given me to give your word. Help me to go on and on and on and do it over and over again. I have to depend on you and trust in you and keep putting my faith in you. Thank you for everything and depend on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.